You're listening to Conversations in Atlantic Theory, a podcast dedicated to books and ideas generated from and about the Atlantic world. In collaboration with the Journal of French and Francophone Philosophy, these conversations explore the cultural, political, and philosophical traditions of the Atlantic world, ranging from European critical theory to the Black Atlantic, to sites of indigenous resistance and self-articulation, as well as the complex geography of thinking between traditions and side traditions and from positions of insurgency, critique, and counter-narrative. Today's discussion is with Kyle Mays, who teaches in the departments of History, African American Studies, and American Indian Studies at University of California, Los Angeles, in Los Angeles, California. He is the author of 2018's Hip Hop Beats, Indigenous Rhymes, Modernity and Hip Hop in Indigenous North America, published by State University of New York Press, and the forthcoming book, City of Dispossessions, an historical reflection on black, indigenous, political, and culture work in Detroit, Michigan. He is also the author of An Afro-Indigenous History of the United States, published in late 2021 by Beacon Press, which is our topic of discussion today. Kyle, great to have you here. Thanks for making the time. Thank you for having me, John. Looking forward to the conversation. Well, let me say, uh, before we get into to some questions and, and get our conversation underway, I really love this book. I saw the advance notice for it and, um, you know, put in uh, my order and was really excited when it showed up. Uh, I think this is an incredibly important uh, topic, right, in multiple fields, as well as because this is a trade book, uh, for a general sort of an uh, readerly public and so when i started reading it i had really high expectations for it or high hopes for it i should say and it was just really exceeded those i think it's a fantastic book i really uh not only loved reading it but uh i learned really a lot from it and so i just wanted to say that and say thank you for writing this book i think it's an enormously important contribution uh thank you for for those kind words it's always good to uh, hear people have kind words to say about about the work that you put into something so i appreciate that yeah and you know as you know when you write a book it's not uh you know you sort of sit down and write it in your spare time it's a it's a full spiritual commitment to, to you know mm-hmm. it, uh, your whole life goes into it and uh, all your energy and perhaps uh, significant chunks of your self-esteem <laughs> um <laughs> and you know and so actually my uh, first question is really related to that you know because of what it takes to write a book you know obviously something like serious motivates us right personal intellectual political and mixtures of those and so i wanted to start with just sort of inviting you to narrate uh, as you want narrate us into this project from your perspective you know what sort of ethical personal philosophical political concerns drew you to the questions in the book and why commit yourself to this project now yeah so for me, it's a mixture of both a personal um, commitment to doing this sort of project, especially identity-wise, as an Afro-Indigenous, Black, and Saginaw Chippewa person. Um, it was important for me to write a book that talked about these sort of Afro-Indigenous relationships in history and um, ideology and, and structurally outside of the five tribes. So sort of personal and scholarly in a particular way. Um, growing up, the I didn't see any references to Afro-Indigenous histories around Afro, Anishinaabe, or Chippewa people. But, um, and then the older guy, you always hear people are like, oh, are you Cherokee? When I would say that I was, uh, we'd say Indian back in the day, but Native mm-hmm. or Indigenous. And I'd be like, no. I know like one or two Cherokees that I think I've ever met in my life. Um, But that just wasn't my experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, you know, then I think about all the other Afro-Indigenous peoples who are not connected to the five tribes. That is the uh, Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, and Seminole from the Southeastern United States who are removed to uh, Indian country or present-day Oklahoma uh, in the 1830s. Um, and so politic, like identity wise, I wanted to do that, but politically wise, there's a lot of things happening, especially since like 2015 when there's a 
2014-15, the Declaration of Black Lives Matter, uh, attempted attempts at solidarity between Black and Indigenous groups, whether that's protests around the Dakota Access Pipeline or increased calls around social media for greater solidarity and, and, and conflict as well. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, I thought I'm, it's an urgent moment for me to get this book. And finally, just thinking about uh, personal experience I had in graduate school when uh, um, I was visiting a school for before to f- pick a PhD program and a black professor I was like, oh, I'm, you know, black and indigenous and I want to study the Black Panther Party and the American India movement as a understanding ideology practice. And he said, are you ashamed of being black? One. And then two, uh, there was no relationship between black and indigenous peoples, hmm. which doesn't make sense. And I've shown in the book that that's not true, but it was just surprising both of this political uh, attack, if you will, that is mm-hmm. allegedly ashamed of being black, and then this refusal to understand the connection between black and indigenous peoples in history, which is astounding to me. Yeah, I remember that part of, um, I forget the exact uh, t- uh, name of the, the chapter, but it's like author's note or author's mm-hmm. foreword. Mm-hmm. It was a it was a, a shocking, but I also thought really revealing um, uh, anecdote. It's not really an anecdote, but a, a, a story told into the project, precisely because it exposes you know not only a political hostility, but also um, the depths of ignorance among scholars of American radicalism. You know, I yeah, mean, it really. Yeah, it was uh, certainly a black radical scholar that um, I admired and knew about their work before, before then. But to say something like that is why? Yeah. Is that part of why you decided to, uh, to write this book in that sort of in between sort of public and scholarly register? Yeah. I, uh, I had initially, uh, this is sort of a backstory to the project in a certain way. Mm-hmm. So I had initially written a proposal, um, that talked about really beginning in the 20th century because a lot of the scholarship focuses on the uh, 19th century, focusing on issues around enslavement and dispossession, the early development of the United States and removal all in the, um, uh, the 19th century and a little bit during the era of reconstruction. Mm-hmm. And I was like, there's hardly anything in the 20th century. Really hardly anything about these relationships. And so the initial proposal that I put together focused on um, the Universal Racist Congress, where W.B. Du Bois, of course, the prolific African-American scholar and activist, and Charles Eastman, who is a medical doctor, but an activist and, and a prolific writer in his own right. Um, uh, he was Dakota. And, and then going throughout the uh, 20th century and, and up into the present. So sort of ending around mm-hmm. issues and connecting with indigenous hip hop, black culture and those sort of things. Uh, so I sent it in because I saw that Robin D.G. Kelly had done his book, Freedom Dreams with Beacon Press. And so mm-hmm. I don't know if it's uh, naivete, ignorance, what have <laughs> you. I submitted a proposal to their submission system, not knowing anything about trade presses necessarily. Uh-huh. Uh huh. The only thing I knew is that it wasn't a university press because I didn't want to do a university press. And I didn't hear back. So I was like, all right, let me recalibrate, find something else. I get an email from uh, Guy Achery, who is the series editor for the Revisioning American History series. And she says, hey, uh, this was like three or four months later, by the way. My assistant <laughs> yeah, found this proposal and it's so compelling and interesting can we talk and i was like whoa (laughs) like this is amazing and after talking with her we decided to move forward together and she was like this is only the second thing in my over a decade of being at beacon press where we got a proposal this way Hmm. uh usually it's sort of by word of mouth or they target a particular person to write a book um, but so that's kind of the backstory to how this developed. 
That's <laughs> that's great. I mean, for for those of us who have experience uh, only with university presses or academic commercial presses, uh, yeah, I can imagine after three or four months how how you know completely shocking it must have been for that email to show up. Well, that's great. I'm glad the uh, you know somebody went in the system or however it floated across the who knows somebody's desk. <laughs> So, you know, I'm thinking about the title of the book, you know, The History of the United States is the second half of the title, um, which gives it uh, a particular uh, geographic focus, right, the, the book. Um, and I have some sort of questions maybe we can talk about later about that. But I want to ask about the, the, just the key term, right, that, that, that motivates the whole book, but also structures it, Afro-Indigenous. And thinking about that hyphen between the two. And one, I wanted to ask you how you understand that hyphen. I mean, hyphen signify in so many different ways, right? To connect two things, but also to mark disconnection, to mark a sense of challenge and tension that's productive or at some t- mm-hmm. sometimes uh, destructive. And so in putting it in terms of Afro-Indigenous and having that, that, that hyphen, you know, how does the hyphen function for you? You know, if you could meditate a little bit on on that that hyphenated, because as you said, part of it comes from uh, the that person. Part of the motivation for the project comes from that personal dimension of living that hyphen, right? And and knowing mm-hmm. that's important, um, important untold um, story in, in multiple uh, registers. But it's also a hyphen that that broadens our scope of understanding mm-hmm. for those of us who work on the Americas or the United States. So, how does that hyphen function in the book for you? Yeah, so the hyphen, and that's a good way of putting it. Um, I think intuitively I've thought about that way, but not as explicitly as you articulated here. So it really has three functions. So the first one is to say someone's personal identity, someone who identifies as Black, and that could be a variety of meanings. So, you know, maybe they're from the continent of Africa, maybe they're from throughout the Americas, um, an indigenous, meaning maybe they're from North America, maybe they're uh, indigenous from uh, the Americas as well. So that sort of personal connection. And they distinctly understand that, you know, maybe I have family from both sides mm-hmm. who would identify only as indigenous or only as black or some version of uh, African descended peoples. The other thing is... Uh, looking at the structural relationship uh, between people of African descent and indigenous peoples and the relationship between uh, to the United States and U.S. democracy. Mm-hmm. So that sort of structural analysis. And finally, um, and these are the difficulties of coming up with terms, but one of the questions I wanted to explore and I tried to do so a little bit in this book is, uh, asking the question rhetorically, but also as a matter of understanding history, when did black people or people of African descent, African descended people lose their indigeneity? Because there's a certain assumption about the people uh, kidnapped and forced to come to the Americas during the period of the transatlantic sl- slave trade, all of a sudden became black or racialized capital or arrivance, mm-hmm. as some people say. And I'm like, hold on, these are indigenous peoples, right? Forced into a particular form of migration. And Mm -hmm. because of the slave trade, did they lose their cultures, languages, uh, histories, connection to land, even though that was certainly disrupted? Mm -hmm. No. I mean, we have indigenous folks forced to migrate because of settler colonialism on the uh, U.S. continent. And they Mm -hmm. still were able to replicate that. And again, it's not meant to displace or say that they're indigenous to North America Uh or the Americas. But it is to acknowledge that these people still brought with them, as Cedric Robinson would say, in Black Marxism, their own cosmologies, Mm -hmm. uh, histories, and approaches to and, and understandings of life and knowledge. That's just not easily erased. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's really, for me, those three reasons that explains why an Afro-Indigenous was used versus, say, a African-American and Indigenous history of the United mm-hmm. States. And I spent a lot of time thinking about that. 
Yeah, that's. I'm glad I asked. That was that was really uh, really interesting uh, articulation of that hyphen, and um, you know, in a sense, you know, the answer is I don't read the book, but um, <laughs> but I like that as a way of of you know having read the book, a way of understanding its component parts and how they're working uh, both together and also uh, autonomously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the things I, I will say, and this is um, a question for you, but but also starting with my own sort of interest in the book, you know, one of the reasons why I was so excited when, when I saw it was forthcoming and wanted to read it is I'm finishing up this book on James Baldwin. And uh, the centerpiece of that book is Baldwin's articulation of this notion of home, right? Mm. An African-American right to place right to home. And this is an animating feature of most of, if not nearly all of the African-American intellectual tradition Mm -hmm. has various kinds of articulations, right? What does it mean to claim this place as home? Right. Um, And one of the things that I kept getting stuck with was these moments when Baldwin and, you know, you can see this in other thinkers too. So just talking about him would talk about, you know, having worked the soil, right in in my ancestors my ancestors having worked the soil Mm -hmm. right having bled on this land have a right to 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 this place as home and i like that as an articulation i thought i think it's a powerful formulation from baldwin but i was also you know cognizant constantly of how that very articulation of home and place is premised on mass displacement and genocide Mm -hmm. and of course that idea of you know an African American right to place and and indigenous genocide and mass displacement is sort of at the heart also of that hyphen, right? After if if you think of them as separate, right? Sort of pulling apart mm-hmm, from the mm-hmm. hyphen. So I'm wondering how, you know, this kind of you know basic conflict, which, you know, in many ways just names the two founding wounds of the nation, right? Of of genocide and enslavement. You know, how do you how you think your book negotiates that tension in the broadest sense. I mean, your book has multiple features and, but that's such a deep tension and it seems sort of on first glance to be irreconcilable, right? They're just contradictions. Yeah. Wondering how your book, because a hyphen is not just a contradict contradiction. It's also a sense of dialectical relationship and mm-hmm. disconnection challenge, how your book negotiates this kind of founding wounds. Yeah, and um, there are many parts of the book, but that's sort of the core one. And um, something I didn't mention when I think of the book, like sort of politically, it's also meant to say, what kind of world do we want to live in um, in the aftermath of colonialism and white supremacy, right? And you would have to have good relationships and better relations between these particular groups who we can often look at as separate or disparate politically, socially, economically, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's just important to really take a step back and learning, utilizing the history that I provided here and many other examples that I did not to carefully consider that You know, the conversation around we are a nation of immigrants uh, that you might often hear. Um, Well, black people were forced to come here in a particular way. Uh, Those I'll consider more recently forced to come to the U.S. because, uh, say, from Central America, because of the United States' neoliberal policies. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there are many indigenous peoples uh, from those countries who were forced to come here. And they just are immediately ascribed the idea of um, being Latin American or from the particular country in which they come from, so Mexican, El Salvador, whatever. And I just want us to take a step back and think differently about uh, these particular connections and relationships in a way to move forward. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're going to continue to, if you can't unpack that sort of dialectic, of enslavement and dispossession and issues around the soil who can make claims to particular spaces. And when you make a claim, what does that mean? Who are you erasing? Uh, Are you then um, reproducing forms of indigenous genocide, at least just discursively 
mm-hmm. are reproducing settler colonialism. And I think that's really one of the things that I'm trying to get to in one of the in this book. So what has happened? How can black people reproduce this notion through this idea of the American dream or we say it might say a black American dream, a mm-hmm. uh, dream deferred, of course, it like he would say. Um, but what is the cost of black liberation? Mm hmm. It to me is really the question. And, you know, even someone like Baldwin, who my friend and I affectionately call Uncle James, <laughs> Uncle JV, Uncle James Baldwin, when he's speaking at Cambridge and, you know, articulates uh, that he says you are just, and you realize you are just like the Indians too. I mean, that says black people have a future, but indigenous peoples do not have a future. Mm hmm. Right. And then basing an idea, or at least part of a idea of a black future based on indigenous genocide is morally wrong. And I'm sure, you know, if I were to talk to James Baldwin and be like, do you ever think about it? I'm sure he'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah. that's a thought or any of the people yeah. I write about in the book. But we only go by what the things that they wrote about. Exactly. Yeah, I really like that. The, the way you 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 frame that response in terms of of telling a history like telling an historical story that needs to be told for the all the urgent you know ethical and political reasons you just said um, but also putting it in terms of of what kind of world do we want to live in that sense of futurity um, you know if, if history is about producing a usable past you know it's important to think about you know, what, what are we envisioning? You know, right, this, yeah. this, you know, I never like usable, uh, just a, a word I'm not a huge fan of, but that, that sense of, of there being some use to history has to have a politically salient and clarified uh, future to it. And, you know, that's what I, I, I like about the book. I mean, I, the reason why I framed it in terms of, of Baldwin was just my own sort of anticipation of your work. It's been enormously helpful because these are not available vocabularies or, or, or political and ethical problems. You know, there's not a long, as you said yourself, there's not a long standing conversation about this in which one situates oneself, right? It's really about pulling in those, somebody like Baldwin, pulling out those, those spots of ignorance Mm -hmm. and then asking what would it mean to insert these questions back in. And in that way, I think for, for, for all the public work that your book does, that this is a scholarly thing, which is also publicly relevant, but is a scholarly thing that so many of us will really take from the book. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, in um, like the concept of home and black activism, literature, belonging, whatever we might want to call it, I think I, I understand <laughs> when your ancestors were displaced. Sure. You can't easily just connect to this particular tribe, this particular homeland. You want to create some version of that based on what you know. But and and black people are not immune to the the real function of settler colonialism, which is not only to displace but to create discourses of erasure to mm-hmm. perpetuate this form of uh, of colonialism. Right. That's the other part that. Mm-hmm. I think is central. It's the land being displaced from the land, but also that the public knows little to nothing about indigenous, not only history, but their current situation. It's like, Oh, I didn't know native people still existed. I still hear that often. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was, you know, one of the things I I also really like about the book, um, you know, I like the way I I think it's, it's well written in this between public and scholar will be enormously helpful for, urgent political and cultural questions and for scholarship all at the same time and everything in between and mixed of those, of those two kinds of discourses. But in telling this history, one of the things I I like most about the book is the range of sources that you employ in telling this story, right. And the way you generate are able to mobilize critical concepts to get inside the expressive life and, and, and political life of this hyphen. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking for, you know, that you talk about the Federalist Papers, 
you talk about important political statements that some people know or some people may have a vague memory of mm -hmm. or learn of, but they're important political state statements, you know, poetry, literature, art, but also events, right? You're, you, you also read events uh, of resistance, uh, popular cultural productions, whether it's music or, or, or icons and so forth. And all those various spaces of debate that then help us think about everything from the hyphen to cultural appropriation and, and the political and moral questions around that. So I wonder, you know, to, I want to ask you a little bit about, you know, what what drew you to generate this kind of collage of sources? I mean, the scholars habit is really so much to go to, you know, quote, official documents or uh, a written archive in a library somewhere. But you really expand your sources, right? So I'm curious what you think that range of sources allows you to do that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And then maybe even zooming out from that, a uh, sort of follow-up to that would be, you know, do you think that this is a challenge to people working in, you know, what we might just call critical ethnic studies, to always expand and always be expanding the notion of the archive, mm -hmm. to be about events in, in the whole variety of everydayness and cultural production rather than a really narrow and often very conservative notion of the archive. Yeah. I, um, you know, I'm trained as a historian, but a lot of my mentors are people who study literacy studies, popular culture, um, English lit people like Geneva Smitherman and so forth. And I, I sound like a bad historian, but for me, it's always, <laughs> what are your questions? Mm -hmm. And based on those questions, what is the best approach or method to exploring those questions? And maybe I need multiple uh, methods or approaches in order to really dig into the particular question. So, uh, for example, if I'm interested in understanding in the mid 20th century, black activists, and their conception of indigeneity or land, you know, there aren't a lot of easy sources and access to find. Mm -hmm. And so you have to find people, you have to find people like uh, Stokely Carmichael or Kwame Ture, right? And exploring, does he have speeches? Does, does he have, you know, but did he write things? Of course he, you know, uh, co-wrote uh, Black Power but then looking at speeches of, well, why is he talking about this and what are his political goals? Because they have political agendas as well in all the talks that he's giving, mm -hmm. especially if he's talking in front of a native audience. And I think it's mm -hmm. important to like think creatively uh, as a historian or any other sort of discipline. All right. So I, I do think it's a challenge and a call for, uh, technically speaking, graduate programs to not only uh, help train graduate students, undergraduate too, to think expansively about the archive, about approaches to doing historical research. And they exist, but they're often very disparate. And then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hiring people, say if it's a traditional history department, Get someone who's trained in uh, critical critical ethnic studies. I mean this kind of broadly. Yeah. Who studies something historically, but has an interesting, interesting approach or asks interesting questions that deviate from what you're used to. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the long term, that would help uh, train students to say, oh, I mentioned in the archive, but there's some music way over here that explains exactly what I want to know. And I should be able to use that without having to call mm -hmm. myself, uh, you know, a music musicologist or, or what have you, or a scholar of popular culture. I'm just interested in understanding, you know, dynamics of race and indigeneity, for example. Yeah. I'm thinking about how, you know, my own experience, I'm not an historian, but, you know, I'm more of a cultural theory person, um, just even uh, teaching undergraduates, I, it strikes me as you were talking that that's something that we train out of people. And then you're, you know, mm -hmm. what you're saying is train back in mm -hmm. because your, your average, you know, new and excited to the classroom, 19 year old, is it going to, you know, you want to talk about, you know, 
you know, black feminism, right? They're going to want to talk about Beyonce Mm -hmm. and they probably have heard now bell hooks and, you know, maybe uh, Ida B. Wells. And this mixture, I think, makes a lot of sense. And then there's something about scholarship and scholarly training that really shifts that. And so, um, you know, I think you're exactly right it, that, that the reorientation towards a more expansive archive. Um, and, I, you know, as someone who works in, in the Black Atlantic tradition and, and thinking specifically about the African-American intellectual tradition, you know, all the great thinkers, you know, they turn to those kinds of archives. I mean, Du Bois souls of black folk doesn't work without the spirituals and that's that's right that's a song archive that's a sound archive that's not a a documents found in great barrington massachusetts at at the (laughs) library you know right and you know we can appreciate that from du bois and then we'll read it but we won't you know sort of mimic it in a certain way or uh or like you know like why did he use this sometimes Mm -hmm. i've been in classes uh where I've been in graduate school and undergrad where it feels a literary person. Of course, we talked about those sort of spiritual songs at the beginning. Mm-hmm. If it was a historian. We skipped all the, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> which is, which is fascinating uh, because even in the history class, I'm like, Oh, there's this, this cool thing that he, he has at the beginning. Can we talk about that? I'm like, no, that's not that important. Yeah. Well, I, I remember just anecdotally, um, I teach pretty regularly, teach a seminar on Angela Davis and her uh, book on blues women is really the centerpiece of that course, which mm-hmm. I think always surprises the students a little bit. Um, it's my favorite of her books. But I urge them to go listen to the music. I mm-hmm. say you can't just take what she says about Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith, a little bit about uh, Billie Holiday, but you can't just take her word for it. She's not just overlaying her ideas on these sounds. And most of them, I think, you know, that they've got busy lives. They don't do it. But whenever a student listens, they always come back and they're like, oh shit, it's really about this stuff. You can actually hear Bessie Smith yearning for mobility, right? Teasing men for being left behind and her own capacities to be free. You can hear the antagonism of freedom, you know, all these things. And, um, you know, as as well as when they listen to the spirituals, they're like, oh, Du Bois had something there. <laughs> it wasn't just, you know, it's not just a random citation. It is an archive in all of the ways archives are supposed to really function. So. Yeah. So um, uh, this reminded me, I want, is an issue of copyright, but I wanted to put um, Nina Simone's like lyrics of Mississippi Goddamn and, um, uh, Aretha Franklin's going down slow because Aretha was talking about like returning home. And I think people interpret it and I don't think they're incorrect. Don't get me wrong. It's sort of uh, this sort of return to heaven, but be thinking beyond that in the gospel tradition is, is also about returning home, mm-hmm. right? Being constantly displaced And at least those people early on in the Atlantic world, they're like, I want to go back to the content. I want to go back home. Uh, And that is sort of developed in a certain way. And then Nina Simone saying, I don't belong here. I don't belong there. I've even stopped Mm -hmm. believing in prayer. So if all those things are true, it's talking about the continued rupture of blackness, even in the space that they have now called home and all, always in search of belonging in some particular uh-huh. way. And, and I'll just say real quick. And, uh, one assignment I do have students from teaching an urban's, uh, history sort of class. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, all right, there's no reading. The reading is listening to Marvin Gaye, uh, Stevie wonder, Nina Simone, like, how are they articulating thoughts and ideas about place? Mm-hmm. Uh, and see that, you know, when you listen to an album and you're studying it uh, as a writer, it's a lot of work. Yeah. But I don't think students see that sometimes. They're like, this is kind of fun. We just listen, or I'll listen to Nas Illmatic if we're going into the 90s. Mm-hmm. So this is fun, but you spend way more time doing that than, than reading an article sometimes. Absolutely. You know, I think, um, you know, we're different generations as, as scholars, but, 
you know, I was in graduate school at, in the heyday of cultural studies. Mm-hmm. And the way it got mocked for being sort of fan studies or Madonna studies was a sort of derisive phrase. I mean, it really made me sad because I, exactly what you said. I mean, it's a lot of work. I mean, when you decide that if you're going to talk about, you know, black feminism and you're going to do it through Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey, like Angela Davis does, I mean, you have to be able to hear completely differently. You need elements mm-hmm. of musicology. You need a sense of just what the air feels like in Mississippi, which is very different than what it feels like in Los Angeles or New York mm-hmm. City or Chicago. And um, yeah, no, it's really true. And I, I, there's a little bit of, I don't know, it's not really revenge, but a little bit of pleasure I get when students are like, oh, this stuff's really hard to write about. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's not all it just uh, fan fiction, you know? Right. It's actually. Trying to understand um, a really good musician, uh, whether jazz or just, you know, blues, R&B, rap music, whatever, and spending time to, like, decipher what are they saying. Yeah. And appreciating them as as a, you know, cultural producer is a lot of hard work. And you could be, you know, wrong when you find out, oh, they meant this and not this. Or maybe it's not as deep as you thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that um, last part, not as deep as you thought. That's right. the, uh, everybody's <laughs> bad dream. Well, it's but certainly, it, I mean, it's yeah. intuitive, I think, for a lot of us to say, like, there's such a thing as, like, Memphis sound, mm-hmm. uh, Mississippi Hill Country sound, Mississippi Delta sound, just to take sort of, you know, mm-hmm. one region. These are very close together places, but they sound completely differently and they come from specific places. And everyone can hear that. And people who are hobbyists, even just with the music, know that. But when it comes time to articulate that relationship, that's hard thinking and risk taking, right? Because you have to step outside any sort of comfortable, like causal, like this caused this sound, right? Now, all of a sudden, you're you're trying to get a sense of life world. You know? mm-hmm. And, you know, your collage of sources create, I think, in each chapter, like a real life world of these conflicts or collaborations or moments of solidarity or uprising, you know, you create that full sense of, of life world because of the collage of sources. And that's, that's why I ask, cause I think it's, it's the strength of the book. It's what's interesting for me as somebody who thinks about like, what is the archive? What if the whole world's an archive, but also because of what you're able to do with it and the sense of each chapter having its own ambiance really. Yeah, that's that's well well put, and I I think at least I try to approach uh, approach it that way and and get it through that way. So when I looked at the book title, um, you know, Afro Indigenous uh, and United States, my first thought, and of course it's a chapter in the book, um, and I imagine a lot of people's first thought is Black Power, Red Power, you know, as two. Uh, you know, enormously important, iconic, provocative, generative, radical political movements, post World War II, post nineteen sixty, say. Um, but of course, the book's about a lot more. But I want to ask you about that chapter and that relationship of those two movements in 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 U.S. radical politics. What do you think that your book opens up about that relationship? for us that I don't want to say new, but that is important about understanding it historically, but also because you yourself have talked about the historical nature of this project is also about imagining a future. So also how your staging of that really iconic uh, a moment in, in U.S. history and radical politics, what you think it might be have to say or be instructive uh, for in terms of the 21st century? Yeah, so when I think of Black Power and Red Power, I, I think of them as very similar. So calls for self-determination, yeah, calls for some version of reclaiming land, um, a cultural aesthetic, right? So whether that's an Afro, whether that's uh, bringing back um, some version of bird skin, feathers, earrings, uh, and those sorts of things. It's an aesthetic uh, and political, cultural response to oppression, mm-hmm. and then various forms of of nationalism in some in some sort of capacity. Right, but but uh, and I say the lens of Vine Deloria Jr., one of the most prolific uh, indigenous writers in the twentieth century, 
he was writing during the uh during the red power movement and black power era and one of his uh he has many books one of his most infamous books is Custer died for his sins in Indian Manifesto, originally published in 1969. And he has a chapter on the red and the black. And he's talking about the differences between black and native peoples uh, politically. And he says, native people just want to be left alone. They want the United States to honor the treaties. Black people are fighting for civil rights. Therefore, there's not much of a connection. And uh, black people should understand that. And until they get a version of nationalism, they're not going to go very far. But then in 1970, when he um, uh, writes another book um, from the Trail of Broken Treaties, he has a, it's kind of disappointing in retrospect, but I understand. He has a quote where he says, native peoples were not uh, planning to return any of the land and they're, to anyone and they're planning on kicking out black people, Asians, Latinx folks. It's that they didn't plan on sharing the land. Mm -hmm. And I use that to say there are elements of um, both in scholarship and political indigenous political spaces uh, or versions of nationalism that have been exclusionary to trying to find connections between black people and political struggle. And of mm -hmm. course, on the other side, there have been uh, people of African descent who have continued to kind of erase or ignore that this is indigenous land. Yeah. And one of the two of the key figures that sort of disrupted this were Clyde Belcourt, who uh, passed away very recently, one of the co-founders of the American Indian Movement, mm -hmm. and uh, Sokley Carmichael. So in a speech that Carmichael gave in Minneapolis, or I'm sorry, St. Paul, Minnesota, in the Twin Cities in 1974, uh, he's one of the few black activists, black radicals during the time, who said that this is indigenous land. Mm. And uh, anyone serious about working with Native people should understand this. And I think for the future... What happens when we center indigenous land um, in a variety of even black forms of protest and politics, mm -hmm. right? So when we do that, we become hopefully in better relationships with indigenous nations and indigenous nations, uh, I hope, would find some form of uh, political alignment, like what were there protocols for adopting outsiders, Mm -hmm. uh, if they have to create new protocols. So this is why that particular era for me is important and, and really exploring that through the relationship between Belcourt and Carmichael, where they continued mm -hmm. well uh, into the 90s, which uh, is kind of remarkable that, one, they lived through that era, and two, they, re they continue such a fondness of one another. Yeah. No, it's a fantastic chapter and you know it you know you know all of this is, i think really makes me and i think will make uh, most people familiar with his work really think about about stokely carmichael kwame ture very differently you know it opens up you know that dimension of of his work in such important ways and i've always been a little surprised at how little scholarly treatment he gets as one of the the more adventurous, but also extremely intellectual. I mean, he's a philosophy major at Howard, you know? Um, and these yeah, are these moments right. where he's not only, you know, highly intellectual, but very open to forms of self-critique mm -hmm. and, and self-challenge, you know, to think differently. And for him to say that this indigenous people's land and is really remarkable. Yeah. Um, because he was thinking beyond borders, but he also, because he was in like actual relationships with those different native activists, he understood, all right, they have a particular struggle and we need them for our own struggle. Mm -hmm. Right. And he, he never perpetuated this idea of indigenous erasure. That's very, that's too common within uh, African American political struggles. And I think that word relationships is like such a key part of um, of understanding Carmichael's uh, entire orientation. I mean, that was uh, 
that was part of SNCC training, but also something you took so seriously. You go mm-hmm. live with sharecroppers if you want to mobilize them against mm-hmm. white supremacy and, and, and the Jim Crow state. And, you know, the fact that he was able to live that expansively rather than in, in a particular sort of narrow set of interests. Um, you know, you bring that out. I mean, I don't, I don't know that I've ever read anyone talk very seriously about Carmichael and, and what he thought about indigenous land and rights. Um, that's super, you know, important <laughs> insight, but also, as you were just saying, it opens up this like vision of a, of a different kind of future, you know, one that was sort of experimented with, with one particularly provocative, a couple of particularly provocative and interesting figures, but also something that's always open. Right? Yeah. And, you know, and so thinking about the, you know, these, you know, these senses of strategy and, and, you know, the complicated space around place and, and land uh, you've been talking about, you know, the chapter on policing and violence uh, was really interesting because it shifts that a little bit to start to think that hyphen around, um, I don't know quite what what to call it, but you know claims that are so deeply visceral around around police violence, um, and and uh, visceral in the sense that they don't need a metaphysical overlay or don't have an epistemological or metaphysical sort of story about the the trajectory of a people. It's really about you know mass murder, essentially. Mm-hmm. And when I was reading that, I you know. I, you, you, you reference Black Lives Matter as part of the sort of origin of the book or origin of the thinking around the book. Um, and I think about police violence in the United States around Black Lives Matter. But if you were to say to to me, you know, indigenous, uh, you know, victimization at the hands of the police, I think my f- mind would first go to the extent to which I'm familiar with Canadian you know, mm-hmm. politics because that's been a real sort of centerpiece of, 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 of indigenous struggle in, in Canada over the last 10, 12 years mm-hmm. has been highlighting, you know, massive uh, police uh, violence. But you bring that home in a way that I thought was just so important home, meaning like it's not Canada, it's the United States. It's, 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 it's happening at the same time along this uh, emergence of black lives matter. Right. So I'm curious how you think that this, um, this convergence around police violence or police as an arm of state violence alters or, you know, whether that's deepens, expands, however you want to characterize it, this Afro-Indigenous phrase, right? Because now it's not about sort of shared struggle for liberation, but also shared direct, you know, from the headlines, you know, mass murder on the, on the, part of the state through the police. Yeah. It, for me, it goes back to um, the continuation of uh, sort of the, what Sadia Hartman would say, the afterlife of, of slavery. And we might say the afterlife or the ongoing forms of mass murder genocide. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and to me, it's a function of how settler colonialism works. So I talked about earlier about the displacement the discursive or public discourses that exist to perpetuate indigenous erasure. But there's also the real sort of violence that, that continues well into the present uh, when they're both murdered by the police at very similar rates and not far off. Um, And we, we know mostly sort of crime statistics and forms of violence perpetuated against Native peoples from reservation because it's more documented than urban, even though urban Native populations, um, I haven't seen the 2020 full census data yet, but they're certainly well over 70% still. Um, We know less about those particular populations writ large. And Mm -hmm. for me, understanding the continuation of mass violence and settler colonialism being something that you can put under the umbrella of settler colonialism, something like uh, police violence, mass incarceration, Mm -hmm. because what is the point of mass incarceration to disappear uh, and exploit people for labor Mm -hmm. in a particular way. And it's on us and isolate them 
right? And that's not even to talk about the things that happen within those prison walls. Yes. Um, if that's a function of settler colonialism, then and it's something that disproportionately impacts uh, black, brown, and indigenous folk, then it's something we need to connect and talk about in a very particular mm-hmm. way. Um, most of the things we know about police violence are in border towns, uh, things that can happen on reservation, those stats. But I wish we could have an ex- ex- uh, expansive uh, set of data and analysis of the things that happen to urban indigenous populations because, mm-hmm. of course, they're living right next to, among, with uh, Black people, Latinx folks, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, I don't think I explicitly said it that way, but that's kind of where I wish others would go to, mm. like really exploring those connections that are happening, you know, whether Chicago, LA, and so forth. Um, and none of us can end as by this, whether you're Black, Indigenous, White, whatever, as a particular group, in forms of mass violence without <laughs> without allyship without partnership, without relationships, right? And it's important to understand that as structurally as possible. Yeah. It reminded me of what uh, M.A. Césaire in, in his uh, Culture and uh, Colonization essay called uh, Horizontal Solidarity, hmm. this way of thinking about solidarity. He was thinking of it across the Black Atlantic, but also a year earlier in Bandung in terms of the Global South of you know, whatever our vertical relations, right, which for him was a kind of race essentialism, we have also this solidarity around a shared sense of victimization and the rage that comes from that. And that that's, mm-hmm. you know, for him, like, you know, I mean, he's a cultural producer, he's a culture producer, but in this moment, he was globally political in, in ways that resonated with, uh, in important ways with your very concrete and direct rather than sort of broad gesture uh, that Césaire has uh, engagement with this, like, you know, shared sense of victimization about a particular kind of violence that's connected, as you just said, to this thing called settler colonialism. And that I like that because it elevates the stakes importantly, that it's Mm -hmm. not about, you know, bad police. It's not about different police. It's about this cultural form that's been here for centuries. Yeah. And, And, I mean, all the data exists uh, and why people don't want to see it. They don't prevent crime. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a basic analysis and putting that under settler colonialism, I think publicly sort of adds to the discourse about why you need to imagine different forms of community relationships uh, and justice for those for those exploited communities. So I, you know, that is an interesting segue to the postscript of the book, which I, um, I found, uh, maybe the most interesting part of the book. Um, I think postscripts afterwards, conclusions, um, they're always exciting to read. I always uh, keep myself from reading them first, but you know, anyone who's written a book knows like you get to the end and this is your chance to sort of explore, um, and, uh, you know, work work a little bit differently in terms of your own voice and vision. And I I really love the postscript, you know, it's a, a a meditation on citizenship and sovereignty. And it was so interesting to see that were those, those words, citizenship and sovereignty get talked about because those are, are very um, complicated terms Mm -hmm. and they're terms that, that, that play very differently with notions of belonging so I just want to, it's in some ways, it's just a, an open question. You know, what brought you to sovereignty and citizenship as ways of concluding the book? And how do you think that this postscript changes the way we, or you, you want us to, to hear those words differently? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I had a whole other um, sort of ending. I, initially, I had... it was sort of just short stories about being an Afro indigenous person. What it meant when I did study abroad in Japan, um, <laughs> my experiences there, random experiences within academia, uh, in my personal life, etc. And 
while I think that would have been a useful sort of postscript conclusion, if you will, and that was that was mostly for uh, Afro Indigenous people, especially on the for the younger crowd, mm-hmm. if they would get a hold of the book. But I explicitly did not write about the five tribes in a, for for uh, research reasons because they have been overdone, and I don't mean that as a as a negative. But they dominate the five tribes that is dominate the scholarship, and so I was like, I can write this book without really talking about them, and I did. And my editor, you know, gave me one last like, there's a Supreme Court decision, or the Cherokee Nation decided to more actively try to include the uh, the freedmen, and I was like, all right, I'll write something short because uh-huh. uh, we're getting to production time. And so I just tried to give a brief overview of the experience of the, the freedmen. So the freedmen are basically enslaved Africans uh, under the five tribes who, along with the five tribes um, who were removed in the 1830s under the presidency of Andrew Jackson, uh, when they relocated, the, the enslaved Africans were the people who ended up building new plantations, new towns, et cetera, as they adjusted to um, living in Indian Terrier, present-day Oklahoma. Um, Factions of those five tribes sided with the Confederacy during the Civil War because the Confederacy said that they would uh, give them, they would allow them to keep their land, give them representation in government, and generally leave them alone. Uh And so they decided, let's go to the Confederacy. After the Confederacy lost, the United States said, well, you have to sign this treaty, basically saying you have to end slavery. Uh, and by ending slavery, you have to include those formerly enslaved Africans as citizens. Mm-hmm. This has been a contested thing, at least since the 1890s. And in 2007, the Cherokee uh, principal chief, uh, Chad Smith, decided that this treaty was forced upon us and we don't have to include uh, those Cherokee freedmen, they're called as citizens. And that's been an issue for years. Uh, the uh, Black Caucus and Congress is constantly saying we need to take resources away from the fire tribe. So all that to say, for me, is a question of how do we deal with the concepts of sovereignty and citizenship when these are sovereign nations under really the protection, so it's a limited sovereignty, under the protection or the jurisdiction of the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. So it's very limited. And um, where do Black people or citizens connected to those five tribes fit in notions of citizenship? Uh, And I think I say in there, the United States is wrong. I, I don't think they should interfere in tribal issues if they're a sovereign nation. The five tribes should absolutely give citizenship <laughs> to those people. So everyone's kind of in the U.S. putting pressure on them as a sort of moral thing mm-hmm. uh, is the right thing to do. So every all these positions to me are, uh, are are accurate. But the right thing to do is just for them to give them citizenship mm-hmm. uh, and not a limited citizenship, which some of the five tribes have done. Uh, you can be a citizen, but you can't access funding. Um, you can't. Uh, get housing or things like that, mm-hmm. but just make them citizens. It's the right thing to do. What do you think the are the implications of this book? Uh, to history of the United States. What do you think's a, a implication? Uh, some of the implications of this book for thinking about blackness and indigeneity across the Americas, because of course this is a, a hemispheric question. Um, different, you know, parts of the hemisphere have different uh, relationships to these questions in terms of, you know, what, what indigeneity and, and blackness mean, but also, uh, you know, the way histories play out. But do you think there are any implications to draw from this very focused study in terms of, of the nation, like the, the, the boundaries uh, for the hemisphere as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of discussions around land that uh, have existed for centuries now, but, um, but, you know, 
one of one of a book that's influenced me for years now, Shona Jackson's book Creole Indigeneity, uh, which he's book. talking the Caribbean and how uh, even in a sort of post colonial nation state, um, Black Caribbean folks are erasing Indigenous peoples and then claiming to be the original peoples of this particular land mm-hmm. and. It's a difficult conversation, but that happens in other parts of the Americas as well, this sort of erasure. And for me, the implications are if these people are still here um, or elements, cultures, et cetera, what would it mean to be in good solidarity, right? And not Mm -hmm. reproduce notions of settler colonialism. And I think throughout the America, that's something that... um, we can continue to discuss. And I hope this book adds to that conversation, even just accepting the nation state as the preeminent form of government, governmentality. Mm -hmm. And you just accept that and thinking of, no, we should reject as Glenn Coltar say, the colonial politics of recognition Mm -hmm. as much as Mm -hmm. possible. Uh, What that looks like could vary, but I think that's really the goal. And by rejecting the colonial politics of recognition, they're also rejecting something uh, like the American dream or, Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. you know, Mexico is a state that's committed all sorts of genocide against its own indigenous population, but has decided to create a homogenized nation state. Hell, Japan too, right? (laughs) Uh, I mean, one of the stories, it's a brief side note, one of the stories I was going to put in there When I was studying abroad in Japan, I heard about the Ainu, which is an indigenous group, mostly in Hokkaido, the most northern island. And my uh, Japanese professor, I asked him about it, and he said, no, that's irrelevant. You don't need to talk about that. But it was a sort of key moment of me of like, oh, indigenous eraser is kind of kind of (laughs) global in a a, and I just (laughs) I was told Japan is homogenous before I left. Yeah from the direct program directors for the study abroad, et cetera. And I'm like, Hmm, this sounds very familiar to me. And I was 19. So it kind of tripped me out. Yeah. No, that's a, uh, you know, I think, you know, if there's any, uh, you know, if there's any scholarly motivation that came from that around when somebody tells you, you don't need to know about that, that needs to be a book written. Um, <laughs> that's a way of, uh, making lemonade out of lemons or however that thing goes. Um, Absolutely. I had a a similar sort of thing in in Sweden and talking with Swedish uh, intellectuals and they have have their sort of hidden indigenous erasure as well, you know, and it was, this was a post-colonial theory uh, gathering, but uh, they were really struggling with this, what they called Nordic colonialism, which is something Mm -hmm. I hadn't even Mm -hmm. heard of, but it's, like you say, this is you know, this is not a problem that's relegated to just the United States, obviously, or to North America, or just the Americas. So, you know, and I think you know, I said it at the beginning. One of the things I love about the book is that it's scholarly and and it's public facing at the same time. And I think in both of those registers, it really does generate a series of ethical imperatives, but also political frames for doing Mm -hmm. exactly that kind of work, you know, comparative work, right? Comparative work that draws on the wisdom and insight from a tradition in order to modify itself, to see something in other traditions, other regions, other places. I think it's a real accomplishment of the book, right? And that way I hope people who are interested in, say, you know, the black Americas and the indigenous Americas. I hope that's not the only readership. Me too. Because first of all, everybody needs to know about this stuff. I mean, if you, if you set foot on land, you need to know this stuff, but also because of the way it opens back to whatever regions, whatever problematics people study. The book does that. And so, you know, on that theme, say of uh, readers, um, I always like to ask this question. I ask it of myself when I'm writing as well. Um, You know, readers read your book and they just do with it whatever they want. And that's both what's beautiful and anxiety producing about, about writing and publishing is (laughs) you can't 
Yeah. I mean, I think we should control our imperial impulses of making people see things the way we want them to. But, um, uh, you know, people do what, what they will with the book. And that's part of the creativity of scholarship and reading and thinking generally. But also as writers, uh, we have an idea of, if not particular content or politics, just some sense of sensibilities that a reader would walk away from a book with. Right? And so when you imagine somebody reading this book, what are some of your sort of hopes in terms of the sensibility of the reader and how it's changed and how it's reoriented? What do you hope the book does to the sensibilities of your readers? I think fundamentally for me, it's I hope that readers really interrogate uh, what they believe about U.S. democracy uh, its potential for getting justice for black and indigenous peoples. Uh, when Tocqueville says in Democracy in America that I, I don't really see how black natives and whites can live on this land together. Right? I mean, I think that should be taken kind of seriously because over time, yeah. you know, since, since that book came out, <laughs> it's been, you know, we've lived on the same area, but it's been vastly unequal in a lot of ways. And then mm -hmm. even, you know, poor whites who continue choosing their own economic or not their economic interests, but their, their notion of whiteness <laughs> or race mm -hmm. uh, over their own economic interests, you mm -hmm. know, over and over. Um, that should say, that should tell us a lot about how U.S. democracy functions. And even when black activists, whether Baldwin, MLK or others are talking about, you know, we, these ideals may have been produced by these uh, racist colonizers back in the day, but they're still worth it. And I, I don't think we can so easily just say that, that mm -hmm. these are the ideas they produced. Um, and are these the best ideas, the constitution or um, declaration of independence? The Why do we hold them in such sacrosanct and, Mm -hmm. Can we imagine something else? I mean, other countries have changed <laughs> constitutions, yeah. et cetera, uh, over centuries, multiple times. I always think of France mm -hmm. as one, one particular way. And, mm -hmm. you know, why not think of Haiti? No, mm -hmm. That was uh, the gold standard for black people and other oppressed people during that particular time period. Mm -hmm. Um the U.S. Has, has not been good to any black or native peoples or ex, ex, poor people, et cetera. So it, it, for me, it's interrogating, like, what is American democracy? Like, really thinking about it mm -hmm. and what has it done and what can it do? And what I like about the book, you know, and I, I think that that's certainly a walk away for readers uh, because – not only is there content around that, like here are different ways of imagining, right, relationships uh, to place and between groups of people, but also it's so your book is so deeply animated by that ethical imperative. I think it, it comes through all by itself, that ethical imperative to activate a sense of political imagination, right? <laughs> which yeah. strangely, you know, I mean, I think that's, Allegedly, part of what democracy means is, is sort of open political imagination, but boy, we sure don't practice it. But your book, I, I think it absolutely does activate that, but not activate it in principle. It activates it with with a deeply ethical sense. Um, and you know, that's <laughs> that's the sensibility I also would love people to walk away this book with. But what Just about you? About you know, it. yeah. Just I mean, what about you? You know, you're someone who, uh, you know, you wrote the book, you had to start it on page one. I don't know if you remember that day. <laughs> There's always, you know, day of page one. Um, and we have a vision of a book and we put in all of that work. And we also, like readers who read, emerge out of it differently, right? In one way or another. And I'm curious how you emerge from the book. And I mean that in terms of if you want to, you know, what kind of projects are you taking on next? I think that's always interesting, but I also am always wary about putting it that way because you have a right to breathe and to celebrate your book, right? <laughs> but I'm thinking more deeply, like how how did the book, not necessarily change, but how did it 
how did it alter or enhance or intensify certain sensibilities of yours? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll sort of do this in reverse. So uh, I have a book coming out in May called City of Dispossessions, Indigenous Peoples, African Americans in the Creation of Modern Detroit. And it's based mm-hmm. on um, my dissertation work. Mm-hmm. And it looks at the concept of dispossession and how it's impacted both the development of the city of Detroit and what role Black and Indigenous peoples played in that uh, particular development. Um, mostly from the late 19th century uh, up until the emergency uh, management era. Okay. Uh, sort of like 2013 and, be, and a little bit beyond. <clears throat> so that's coming out in May. So I was sort of working on both of the, these projects at the same time. And um, I think what has changed for me is becoming more critical of capitalism in a particular way. And I was, I've always been kind of critical, but digging deeper into the intellectual uh, components of, of the characters in the book or understanding better the structure of the book and its relationship to American democracy. And, you know, obviously not the first uh, Afro indigenous black or indigenous person or critical person to really come to this conclusion, but really the question of, can you have black and indigenous freedom liberation through U.S. democracy. That's sort of an age old question, right? For many radicals, but to me, it's just like a huge contradiction mm-hmm. that many people before me have tried to explore, figure out, and they're like, I just don't see how this works. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's kind of where I'm at uh, right now. Um, and as far as other projects, um, I got to do something on the Buffalo soldiers. So it's not in the book. Uh, and it was mostly a COVID issue because I could, I couldn't travel uh, and do certain sort of yeah. research that I wanted to. I was just like, all right, I'm going to go in March, early April, but I had the publication deadline. Well, I, mm-hmm. I think that's something I'm going to try to tackle next. That sounds fantastic. I, I mean, I, I, there will be a huge readership for a Buffalo Soldiers book for sure, and and I can't wait to read this book on on Detroit. Um, I, that sounds really really interesting, and you know you can't get a much more important city than Detroit in terms of U.S. history, and so to tell it in that frame, I think is it's going to be really exciting. We'll have to when it when it comes out, oh, yeah, we'll have to sure. talk. We'll have to do another podcast because <laughs> I can't wait it. to I'm read down. that. Um, well, I really appreciate your time. This is such an, an excellent book. Uh, thank you for writing it. Um, I learned a lot from it. So many people will learn a lot from it. It sets out a whole series of ethical and political challenges, uh, but also challenges so many of us as scholars in really productive ways. And so I really want to say thanks for the book uh, at all of those levels, because I think it's going to impact so many of us in, in really, really great ways. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you, John. Really appreciate the question, the conversation. It's been a blast for me. All right. Well, you take care. We'll talk. uh, We'll talk when your Detroit book comes out. (laughs) Absolutely. All right. Bye-bye.